We are delighted to welcome our guest speaker this morning. We do want to thank him for finding time. I know it's been a busy first couple of months in Washington. Um, and of course, his appearance couldn't come at a better time. It seems as if there's something new happening in our nation's capital um, every day, or several times every day, uh, hourly, uh, by the minute, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, first, something a little bit about him. He was born and raised up in Schenectady, attended Colgate University, graduating with high honors. He earned a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford, and from there, he went to law school at Harvard, and that is where he met his wife, Lacey, a native of Woodstock and Kingston. He was elected to the 19th District in Congress this past November and was sworn in just last month. He uh, has his committee assignments already and a lot of synergy with us and our businesses and the related industries going on in our region. He'll serve on the House Committee on Agriculture, Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, and also the House Committee on Small Business. He and his wife live in Rhinebeck with their two sons, Maxwell and Coltrane. Please give a warm Ulster County Regional Chamber of Commerce welcome to Congressman Antonio Del Cairo. Thank you, sir. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Brave in the cold. Uh, really excited to be here. There's a lot going on uh, in D.C. and some might say too much uh, going on, but it is good to be home. Uh, this is my first uh, in-district work week. You get one of these uh, every month, the third week of every month, um, and we did not have one in January uh, because of the shutdown. Um, and so uh, it has been really exciting uh, to be able to stay home for an entire week, not just because I see my wife and kids, which is nice, um, but also I get the chance to go all across the district as I have been uh, engaging uh, with constituents, talking about a host of issues. I think we're going to do something like six town halls uh, over the course uh, of this week. So uh, really, really excited. I believe actually we're going to have a town hall in Ellenville um, on Saturday. So all right, Ellenville in the house. All right. I, I want to start by, you know, first thanking uh, Ward Top, President, appreciate um, the invitation, the chamber as well, uh, the sponsor um, as well, uh, Alzheimer's Association, great work that you're doing. I really appreciate that. I uh, want to uh, thank each and every one of you. I see a number of folks in here. I'm not going to try to name or acknowledge everybody, but I do see the mayor, Mayor Noble, so good to see you. I know I saw the controller earlier, Elliot Arbach, thank you. Um, and if I missed you, sorry. Um, but really excited to see everybody here. I want to, uh, and of course, Peggy. <laughs> Not forget about my mother-in-law. By the way, by the way, I'll tell you something. I don't think there's a better job for a mother-in-law to have than to own a liquor store. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we stay fully stocked. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I really am. I want to spend a little bit of time sharing my thoughts on economic development, uh, empowering uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, and thinking about how we can uh, grow small businesses. I'm going to discuss a little bit about health care, discuss uh, on ways to lighten the burden on business owners, as well as other uh, local, state, uh, and national interests. I believe um, it's important as we move forward uh, to first talk a little bit about, as alluded to, where I'm situated now in Congress and how I feel like I'm uh, really in a great place to do the work of advocating on your behalf, whether it's the Agriculture Committee, whether it's Transportation and Infrastructure, or whether it's Small Business. Each of these committees, in my estimation, um, are the defining sort of committees for this region. Um, and so I was very intentional about pursuing each of these committees, thinking about economic development, thinking about rural development, thinking about how we invest in our future and grow our economy for generations to come. Now, we all hear the stats about small businesses, um, right? 99% of them make up U.S. businesses. Two out of every three jobs are created by a small business. Um, half the country is employed by small businesses. But particularly here in upstate New York, uh, small businesses are the backbone uh, of this region. Uh, we have vibrant main streets, uh, family-run shops and farms that are passed down from generation to generation. 
And I want to work to make sure that we can continue that upstate business owners are given the tools they need to succeed, whether that's help from applying for farm grants or access opportunities for economic development or simply having an advocate in Washington. And I certainly consider myself uh, an advocate. Now, some of you may know the largest sectors uh, in small business in our area include scientific and technical services, construction, retail trade, real estate, health care. Uh, and there's lots of room for growth uh, in these areas with proper investment. And the question ultimately is, how do we grow? Right? What is the way forward to grow out these industries? How do we make it happen? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I consider the different ways we can do this. And there are a handful. Uh, the key, in my estimation, is access to capital, making sure that our small business owners actually can receive affordable capital. I hear many entrepreneurs and small business owners say they aren't able to access affordable capital. And the lack of funding makes it hard, as many of you know, for small businesses to reach their full potential. Uh, it prevents growth and diversification in rural economies like ours. And I intend to focus on this issue and advocate for federal policies that provide solutions like empowering local banks uh, to make loans to small local business owners and entrepreneurs, make small business administration grants more accessible for people here in upstate New York, and make sure a tax reform uh, is not just benefiting big corporations and the wealthiest among us. Now, I've talked a little bit about in the past how a lot of the benefits that have been made for community banks, small banks, or small business owners always seem to come with strings attached. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when you look at the last tax bill, when you have massive breaks for big corporations uh, and a cap on salt to pay for a bill that has a trillion and a half dollars to our deficit, that poses a problem uh, for economic growth for the future. Make no mistake about it, there were some great pieces to the tax bill as standalone pieces, whether it was doubling the state of deduction, whether it was making sure that you could increase or write off your depreciating assets 100% in the first year, or whether it's expanding Section 179 and bumping up 500K to a million dollars uh, for your business equipment. All great things for small business growth. My trouble, as I've talked about in the past, is that that was all paid for, or I shouldn't even say paid for, that was all undermined uh, by wealth giveaways, uh, adding again a trillion, and a holler, da trillion dollars to our deficit on an annual basis. Now, why does that matter? Why does that matter? $22 trillion, the highest debt this country has ever seen in our country's history. For my fiscally responsible individuals out there, that should make you a little nervous, just a little bit because it's handcuffing our ability to invest in our future. It's handcuffing our ability to invest in local and small business growth. We are not spending in a way that is helping us invest in our future. We are adding, projections say, a trillion and a half dollars over the next 10 years on an annual basis. Our, our deficit will be $29 trillion by 2029. Two years ago, the debt to GDP ratio 78% of our debt made up our GDP. It ballooned in the last two years up to 93%. We haven't seen these levels since the end of World War II. Think about that. Now, we can sit here and say we could just keep printing money. I disagree. We have got to invest and grow our GDP at a faster rate than our debt. That is how you grow the economy from the ground up. And I think if we actually make sure we have real tax reform that puts more and more money in the pockets of everyday Americans and small business owners like yourselves, that is how we can begin to invest. But what are we going to invest in? That's the key. Now, what are we going to think about that can grow out our economy? Well, let me talk to you about what I think we might want to invest in. It. And I'm hearing this all across the district when I talk to constituents and small business owners. First and foremost, we need to invest in workforce development and skill training programs. Education. We've got to make sure. Thank you, Pat, for that. <laughs> you know, we've got to make sure that the people here at home have the skills that they need to take on the jobs that are available. And we can match the needs of employers with training programs at local community college, colleges so that our young people are gaining skills in areas where jobs currently exist and in industries expected to grow in the near future. 
And there are programs like this that we can model out. Ulster County Community College, Pathways Program, works with young kids, six-year program, works with the surrounding business community, focuses on the skill sets that the surrounding business community needs so that when these young people graduate, they have jobs waiting for them on the other side. There are work apprenticeship programs. I actually visited one uh, local IBEW. Great programs for young men and women who aren't going to go off to college but want to get the kind of trade and trade, vocational school training that they can pursue to get good paying jobs with benefits. We also can be focusing on investment in renewable energy space, green jobs. There's real effort in this department. We see that all of the economic growth and all of the job uptick is in the renewable energy space, from geothermal to solar to wind. And we've got to stop propping up industries that don't need any more help from our taxpaying dollars. We've got to start propping up the future. Yeah. Broadband access, quality cell service, infrastructure, these are the nuts and bolts of how you have access to markets. Hard, as I've traveled across this district and all throughout more rural parts of Ulster <laughs> County, to see how you can spur and incentivize economic growth when you don't have the means to access the marketplace. And the means include broadband access, high quality, speed friendly broadband access. The means include quality cell service. The means include roads, rail, bridges, and localized infrastructure, particularly for our farming community. And I'll get to that. When I have, um, and I've, this whole week I've been making it a, sort of an ag week, meeting farmers all across the district, up in Delaware, Sullivan, Montgomery County. A lot of farmers, from dairy to beef, fruit, vegetable, grain. And what I have heard time and time again from our farmers is that we are not providing the local infrastructure that they need. They are being beholden to the global market, beholden to it. And it's important that we figure out the science and the technology, whether it's on-site processing plants or distribution plants or region-based processing distribution plants or whether it's farm hubs. There are ways in which we can localize the marketplace and build out our infrastructure with proper investment. But again, this is going to take investment. Investment. And it's important to understand what I mean by this because every dollar we invest in our infrastructure returns on $1.80, ROI. We got to start thinking smart, and I'm sure all you all know this as business people. We got to think smart about how we invest our dollars. I'm not sitting up here saying we just spend willy-nilly. What I'm saying is we spend money in a way that gives us a return on our investment, rather than just throwing the money away to places and to people who don't need it. We've got to change the mindset here and get back to the business of empowering everyday Americans just like yourselves. Now, lastly, and I'll spend a little time on this one because I think it's an important issue. Um, conclude and then take your questions. Uh, healthcare. One of the biggest things that I think is burdening folks all across this country, uh, and including small business owners uh, like yourselves, is the cost of healthcare. I think it's high time that we introduce a public option and make sure that Americans all across this country have the opportunity to choose Medicare. Choose it. Why is this important? Well, one, right now, as many of you know, the private insurance marketplace just has, in essence, a monopoly if you don't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid. And you are beholden entirely to the profit insurance mentality. The only way we can change this dynamic, in my estimation, particularly in the short term, it's not to do away with the whole system, which I believe is an incredibly hard, uh, and I think at this point, uh, uh, not the practical approach, but to actually insert a public competitor in the marketplace. And that public competitor is Medicare. We know that if we allow everybody to opt in, it's gonna drive down premiums, it's gonna drive down deductibles, it's gonna turn a high risk pool into a more healthy pool, and it'll pay for itself, not to mention the cost of administering healthcare claims is seven times less the cost of administering private insurance claims. Now, if you're a small business owner and you're on the hook 
to figure out how you're going to provide employer-based insurance for your employees, wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, well, guess what? You can choose Medicare. And if you are an employee and you feel like you're a little trapped at your place of employment because of the health care provider, wouldn't it be nice to be able to say, you know what? I actually have the freedom to pursue other opportunities because I can choose Medicare. That type of risk taking is how you create economic growth from the ground up. Big proponent of this. I also think that if you are self-employed, and I'm thinking that this is, uh, well, I know we have a lot of folks who are self-employed in our district, thousands. You should be able to write off your health care as a business deduction. I think that's another piece to this puzzle. So all these things we should be considering with great intensity. Unfortunately, we're not doing this right now in DC. You might think that I have just came from another planet the way that I'm talking, <laughs> to be honest with you, because we're not talking substantively at all about our economics. No one's talking about the national debt. No one's talking about bankrupting our future. No one's talking about investing smart in our future. No one's talking about workforce development and training programs. You know why? Because too many folks there right now are worried about headlines and worried about their own interests and are influenced by special interests and are not beholden to the people who put them there in the first place. Now I made a point, and I'm gonna continue mm -hmm. to make it a point as I travel all across this district to make it clear to every one of you in this room and beyond that I'm only here to serve you, irrespective of party, Democrats, Republicans, independents. Like that. Now I will say, I have the benefit of representing this wonderful district, which is magnificent in many respects, uh, but one of the unique characteristics of this district I have learned uh, since being in D.C. is that we're a third independent, a third Democrat, a third Republican. Okay? Doesn't happen that often. A little thing called gerrymandering prevents that. Okay? Most of the seats in D.C. are about as blue as they can get and about as red as they can get. And it disincentivizes finding common ground. Because all you got to worry about is being primary. And that's it. Well, one, I'm happy to not have to operate in that dynamic because it makes me work. I think, like to think I work anyway, but it's very good to know that the people of this district will hold my feet to the fire and make sure that I do right by everybody and strive to find common ground to make sure that we all can advance our shared values and our shared principles for the betterment of generations to come. And that is the work that I will set about to do on all the committees that I'm on and as your advocate in Washington. I really appreciate the time to be here. I'm excited to take your questions and look forward to serving you for months and hopefully years to come. Thank you.